Okini Soka, Idames Ganatini, Nistuna Danako Aksi Estuaki. Hello, all my relations. My name is Jamie Medicine Crane. My traditional name is Brave Woman. I come from Kainai and Bikani Nations, which is the Blackfoot people of Southern Alberta. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. Um, here in Amiskwichi Wahagan, excuse my pronunciation. Um, I am Blackfoot, not Cree. Um, it is such an honor to be here with all of you for this OE Global Conference. I think it's very special and close to my heart because uh, Norquest College is hosting it and that's where I'm working right now as a curriculum developer or designer. And it's such an awesome time to be there because there's so much in education that uh, we have never really fully fully um, looked at. And our people here on Turtle Island have been impacted by education in many ways. And I'm gonna share some of that throughout my little time here with you. Uh, but I just wanna welcome all of you. I'm gonna play an honor song to honor Mother Earth, to honor our land that we're on. Um, since our conference is theme is around sustainability, I just want you to keep that in mind. How, how are you going to keep this land and this world for our, for our generations to come? So. Thank you. So I've been, I've been thinking about what I want to say to all of you from all around the world about sustainability. And I was thinking about a lot of the teachings that I've been taught as, I grow, as I've grown up to be this young lady in front of you. Um, and one of the things that always stuck in my mind, or one of the things that stood out in my mind while I was thinking about all of this, is that relationships. Relationships is really important relationships with ourselves, with the people beside us, the people around us, our families, our communities, but not just people, the other beings, the animal beings, the plants, the sky beings, all the beings that make up this universe. And when we look at the relationship to the land now. It's as broken as the relationship that we have with each other and with ourselves. 
And one of the things that I, I started thinking about that an elder shared with me is that ceremony, ceremony was created to remember. We do ceremony because we remember ceremony so that we could remember. And so I think about that because every season my family has ceremony. And we just had a ceremony not too long ago where we opened our bundle. And in those bundles, there are sacred objects and sacred, um, I guess, artifacts are in this bundle that, have, that are thousands of years old and that have been handed down from generation to generation. And each of, in each of those bundles, there's, a, um, there's different teachings, different songs, different ways of doing things. So when you go to ceremony, they're not the same. They, they might have some similarities, but there's some differences in the ceremonies. And that was one thing that when I moved up here to um, Treaty 6 to Amiskachiwahagen, uh, that I realized is that ceremonies are different. You know, like I come from the Blackfoot people and coming up here to Cree country, Cree territory, uh, the ceremonies are different, but they're the same. But they're different. They're the same in that we're honoring the land and we're honoring the the beings that help us to live in this world. And we're thanking them. We're thanking our ancestors for being here. And I thank all of you for being here. And I thank all of you for being educators and having that open mind to be able to, to change education. Because if you listen to the stories of um, the history of education here on Turtle Island, it wasn't the greatest. Uh, there's a lot of trauma, and it still has rippled effect. You know, I'm the first generation in my family that didn't go to residential school. Um, and if you don't know much about residential schools, um, I ask you to, to learn a little bit more about them to understand the history of this country. Um, and the reason why I wanted to share that with you is because we have a relationship with the land, just like this flute. The story that I heard about this flute was long, long time ago. This was an instrument that was created for a love, a love song. And it was a, this gentleman, and he really wanted to get the attention of this young woman. And no matter what he did, he would not be able to get her attention. So he thought, I'm going to go out to nature and I'm going to go pray. So he went out into the forest and he started praying, started asking Creator and his ancestors to help him in this journey. And not too long later, he was sitting under this tree. He heard this, so this sound. And he kind of looked around, didn't know where it came from. And he heard it again. And he didn't know where it came from. And finally, he looked up, and there was a branch sitting up above him. And on top of that branch was a woodpecker. And every time he heard that sound, the woodpecker would make a sound or a hole into the branch. And so. With his intuition, he knew that he had to take it down, and he started playing a song. He took that song with him and he started walking back to his camp and he kept playing that song. And as he got closer to the camp, the people started like, whoa, what's that sound? And um, the woman came out of her teepee 
And when she came out of her teepee, he started playing her song. Finally, he got her attention. Do you know what happened after that? They lived happily ever after. <laughs> so that's the story that I have with the flute. And one of the things that like I was listening to, one of my favorite books is um, called Braiding Sweetgrass. If you haven't heard it, um, that's a really awesome book to read. Um, it's also available on audiobook because I drive a lot, so I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Um, but she talks a lot about that relationship, that reciprocity that we have with the land. And when we think about um, sustainability, when I think about sustainability, I think about that. I think about that reciprocity. And like I think about the teachings about our people, about the um, Nitsitapi, and not just the Nitsitapi, the Blackfoot people, uh, but a lot of Indigenous people believe about the seven generations. So when we look at seven generations, we think about the seven generations um, behind us, and we also think about the seven generations in front of us, and how this world is going to be um, sustainable for them. I remember when I was a little girl, I was, um, we go to the river and I drink the water out of the river. Now we can't. Um, there's certain places that you can. I had the honor of climbing Chief Mountain, which is in the United States this um, summer. And there was springs all over and I was drinking that water like crazy because water is life. Without water, we can't survive. And so how are we going to create a sustainable world for our youth, for the generations that haven't come, and for, for all the people, for all of us that are here? And it's about building that relationship, relationship with ourselves, with each other, with the land, with the animals, the sky and the stars, and, and everybody. So here's another song for you. Thank you. Before I leave, I just want to say Gitsi Gakko Mim, and that means I love you in Blackfoot. 
and I hope that you have a wonderful conference and continue to think about building sustainability through our open education resources. Um, in education, how can we create those learning spaces for our learners to be engaged fully in different ways? So thank you so much, and Gitsi Um We don't have a word for say for goodbye, so um, we always say Gitamatsin, which means see you again. Well, good morning, everybody. One more round of applause for Jamie. Thank you. OK, well, welcome to day two of the OE Global Conference 2023, Building a Sustainable World Through Open Education. My name is Dawn Witherspoon. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm one of the program co-chairs for this conference. I welcome you all, if you're new today, to Amiskwichi, Wiskigan, also known as Beaver Hills House and the City of Edmonton. And I also welcome all of you connecting online through OE Connect. We hope you use the platform to connect with others around your global community. Well, yesterday was quite the day. Talking with some of you last night at the event, I heard words like inspired, innovative, motivative, motivated, that was a new word, <laughs> curious, and I can't wait for day two. Well, here we are, and today we have two keynote speakers. Excellent. So we have a Welcome to Canada video from the Honorable Randy Boissonneau, Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Official Languages. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Tanse, Tawau. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are gathered here today on Treaty 6 territory and Métis homeland region 4. Thank you to Northwest College and Open Education Global for championing equitable access to education and lifelong learning. As Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Official Languages for Canada, I would like to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the Governor of Canada to today's advocates, decision makers and attendees from around the world to our beautiful city of Edmonton. I extend my sincerest regret that I couldn't be with you in person, but I am celebrating in the energy and enthusiasm of this amazing conference. Open education is not just a concept, it's a movement that has the potential to transform lives, communities, and entire nations. It's about breaking down barriers to education, making knowledge freely available to all, and leveling the playing field so that everyone, regardless of their background, can access the tools and resources they need to succeed. It's easy for us sometimes to take the skills that we learned growing up in school for granted because education is such a pillar of our society and yet it is so critical to how we live our days as human beings. These skills are what help us connect with each other, find our best first jobs and create meaningful careers. Education is power and if education is power then open education extends that very power to many who may have never had it before. This is reflected right here in our city's education district, in my own federal riding of Edmonton Centre, made up of so many amazing post-secondary institutions like Norquest College, McEwen University, Nate, and the University of Alberta. These institutions know firsthand how to support students who come through their doors to help them reach their fullest potential. Edmonton is also honored to be the first Canadian city to join UNESCO's Global Network of Learning Cities. Together, we can and will work towards providing equitable access to education for all. Thank you again to Northwest College, Open Education Global, and all of the organizers and attendees for making this event possible. Together, we are working towards a brighter, more inclusive, and more open future. Thank you, merci, hi hi. I have things in a different order. Well, let's start with this one. So there is a, um, a Padlet 
that we have created, and we're hoping you'll share some of your key learning moments through this tool. You can scan this QR code, and um, we would love if you could share some of your key takeaways or your braiding learnings. We hope you will contribute to this collection, and we can share it in the closing session on Wednesday afternoon. So I'll give you a moment to scan that. We'll have it up again at lunch as well, and again tomorrow. I see some of you still trying to get the code, so I'll give you a moment. Okay. All righty. So there is that ribbon bowl on your table, which has ribbons for braiding. But now it also has some fun facts and interesting tidbits about our great city. The paper has been included as part of our carbon count, so not to worry about that. But we hope you spend some time going through those and learning a little bit more about us. There's a social event tonight at Norquest College starting at 5.30 p.m. until 7.30. This is a ticketed event and tickets were pre-purchased with your registration. There will be buses available from the Chateau Lacombe Hotel to the college and back again. And the first bus leaves at 5.20. The last one back is at 8 o'clock, so don't miss the bus. If you do, you can also take a short minute, a short 10-minute walk. Um, to the college, or back from the college, I suppose, if you're walking together. Um, you want to walk to the college and go through the main doors that are on 108th Street. There's free parking if you're driving in the lot across the street from the college. If you're not coming tonight, please take advantage of the discounts available through the digital swag, and the QR code is at the welcome desk. The there is a talking circle, the closing circle, on Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And that is, um, we're, we have sign up, pen and paper sign up at the welcome desk. So if you are interested in um, closing your time here at the conference um, in a closing circle, please sign up. There is a limited space uh, for this activity. And during your time today, please visit the exhibitor booths in between sessions and on the breaks. There's also the poster sessions, which are down at the end in, by Salon 12. We do have a second keynote today, Sandra Lamouche, and she starts at 1 o'clock. So please come back after lunch by 12.55 so we can get all settled before that begins. And there will be two short afternoon breaks today with afternoon tea served in the 3.30 break. So just take a look at your sched and make sure you know where you're going. We'll also have students from the Faculty of Business and Environmental Technology and our social and digital communications and venture development programs here to volunteer as part of their community service learning projects. They did a great job yesterday helping out with sessions, taking photos, and asking for interviews. And they will be doing the same thing today. Please make them feel welcome and do what you can to help them share the excitement of this conference. I would now like to invite Igor Lesko and Marcella Morales to the stage, interim co-executive directors of OE Global to bring us updates from OE Global. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day, or Tansi, as that's the greeting in Cree language that I learned from Darion, our keynote speaker from the first day, a few months ago. Uh, welcome to the day two. What an incredible day one we had yesterday, right? The opening ceremony, Kyle with his group of drummers and dancers, the blessing ceremony by Walter. Um, and yeah, the mayor of Edmonton uh, proclaimed day 16 as Open Education Resources Day. Isn't that wonderful, yeah? And yes, the inspiring keynote by Darion. Thank you very much. You really laid the foundations. 
about white seeing for conference participants. And as I'm talking to people, I can see how they are applying the principles and values that you described that are associated with this framework uh, during the conference and how they're planning to apply it in their lives in general. So thank you very much. All of these sessions, the concurrent sessions that took place during the day, amazing work, including the reception. Thank you all for being such an engaging and lively audience. So a round of applause to all of you. We are going to be a bit brief because we are running a little bit late, so thank you for your patience to, to Cable Green, our second keynote. Uh, but no, what we normally do with this session during the conference is that we provide short updates about what we have been up to at Open Education Global, which can include relevant updates and as well projects and activities during the past few months. So welcome everyone. Uh, what you see on this slide is, oops. Oh, what's happening? Gremlins playing a trick here. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. There. there you go. Okay, so welcome everyone. So the first thing that we would like to say here is that recently um, we have a, well, uh, a few a few months ago actually we, our the leadership of the board of directors has changed. Uh, so we now have a new president of the board of directors, Perin de Kotlehon. Perin, where are you? Stand up. Yeah, there you go. Congratulations to Perrine, she is from France. We also have two vice president of the board of, di of directors, which include uh, Connie Bloomgreen from Canada and Lisa Young from the United States. Where are you? Please stand up. There you go, Connie. Yeah. Please feel free to approach Perrine and Lisa, as well as other board members during the conference. I will speak about it shortly. Um, the board is tasked with setting the strategic direction for the organization. So if you want to learn more about Open Education Global or what respective open uh, board members are doing in, in their respective regions, please approach them and talk to them, okay? We also had uh, elections earlier this year for the board of directors, and there are two new members who joined the board. That includes Rajiv Jangliani here. Rajiv, please stand up from Canada. Paola Corti here from Milano, from Italy. <laughs> we also had Kathy Kesselly being reappointed for a two-year term as well. Kathy, please stand up. <laughs> and here you can see the makeup of the entire board of directors, all right? And some of them are in attendance, so please feel free to approach them during the conference. We also have Marisol here. So please speak to them if you want to know more about the organization and what we are up to as well. We also really want to express our sincere thanks to Lena Patterson, um, who became the immediate past president when Perrin took over as the president of the board. We are incredibly thankful for all the work that Lena has done for the organization. Also, we would like to acknowledge the work of Diana Hernandez from Costa Rica, who left the board earlier, well, a few months ago, when we concluded the elections, her term was up. Again, thank you very much to Diana Hernandez for everything that she has done for the organization. And we have a special person here in the room as well, somebody who has been serving on the board for 10 years in official capacity as a board member, as the president of the board, as the immediate past president of the board that spans across 10 years, but actually he has been involved with the board for I think 13 plus years, Willem, yeah, from TU Delft. We just really want to acknowledge your incredible contribution over the years to Open Education Global. And here I would like to ask everybody to please stand up and just give a standing ovation. Thank you very much, you may be seated. Thank you, Willem, incredible work. All right, so now we are gonna be speaking a little bit about some of the projects that we are working on and some of the initiatives, and that obvi is obviously is not possible without the incredible team that we have on board. So again, we would like to acknowledge all of our team members, and as I'm gonna be calling on you, please stand up, Una Daly. Alan Levine. Applause 
Rachel Zhang. I love it flat. Mario Badia from Costa Rica. Liziata. Somewhere in the audience. They're at the back. And Jan Gondol from Slovakia. It's an incredible, high-performing team. Thank you very much for everything that you do. Your work makes a difference. <laughs> we just also want to point out that um, uh, as far as the attendees are concerned at this, this year's conference, um, we have um, approximately 150 members or attendees representing OEG member institutions. So a special welcome to all OEG members. Um, and on that note, uh, we have over 200 plus first time attendees. A special welcome to all of you. That's incredible. <laughs> Overall, as Open Education Global, we have nearly 240 institutional members and over 160 individual members. We also have a number of sustaining members and several, several of them are actually in attendance um, Several of them are actually in attendance, uh, some gremlins again, sorry about that. Uh, several of them are in attendance uh, today as well. So we have Open Education France, sustaining member. We also have representatives from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, we also have Taiwan Open Course and Education Consortium. Uh, we also have Tech de Monterrey from Mexico and a few others. So warm welcome to all of you and, and thank you for your support. What we also want to say is that if you have any questions about membership, uh, if you want to become a member, if you are not a member already, please uh, speak to any, to Marcela and I, or any of our team members, or any of the board members as well. And yeah, gremlins are continuing here, so was this, what else did I, I think that was it? Okay, thank you, so over to Marcela now. Thank you, Igor. Um, well, welcome again. I know uh, Igor was uh, welcoming all of you on all of our OE Global team and um, board members, but I just want to say bienvenidos, welcome, and it's been a very exciting time for all of us. And I'm here to share a little about the work that we do at OE Global. And um, the one thing that we really, really like to do is gather people exactly like we are. We like to create spaces where we can connect the people and uh, create spaces where we can learn from each other just as we are here in this conference. Another thing that Open Education Global does is a yearly one week Open Education Week event that I know many of you participate. And uh, this event is usually the first week of March. We have been doing it for since 2012, and we are very excited that we have gathered more than 85,000 people through the years through this event. So I just want to encourage everybody to mark their calendars for next year. It's going to be March 4 to 8, 2024. And we like to think of Open Education Week as the event of the community for the community. If you want to participate, uh, joining an event or promoting something that you're doing, please just follow our social media communication so you will know when the call for uh, proposals is open. We also celebrate, celebrate the community, celebrate the work that the community is doing through the OE Awards. We have granted 237 awards since 2011. This year, uh, 16 awards were granted. Yesterday, we had a lovely presentation of five of the projects that we were able to hear a little bit more about here. Uh, but you can find all the information of the awards on the website and uh, learn about the 16 winners of this year, which I also want to celebrate again and congratulate everybody that has won an award this year. And again, yeah, that deserves a clap. And um, again, the, the, what we like to do at OE Global is not only gather people and try to uh, create spaces where we can share the knowledge. So we foster this knowledge exchange through these type of activities. We have a platform called OEG Connect that many of the presentations of, uh, of this conference are already uploaded there. 
And we also have Alan Levine leading the podcast of OEG Voices, and OEG Live. And these are live spaces where we encourage our community to share their experiences through these spaces. And again, trying to foster the knowledge, we have several regional nodes. Uh, in this case, uh, again, celebrating the CCC OER community uh, and the OILA Tham regional node. These two groups or those, these two uh, different regional nodes are specific, trying to attend the needs of those specific groups. We are also working on the Francophone uh, community that they were gathering this morning. And we look forward to creating more spaces where people can identify and find the needs that uh, they require for promoting and using their open educational resources. And I want to highlight three of the uh, community colleges members that are gonna be having a talk today. So if you want to learn more about the CCCOER members, uh, you can find three talks today, one at 11, 3 p.m. and 3.45. If you want to learn more about the project, the work that they're doing, uh, please don't miss those spaces. And lastly, I just want to briefly uh, talk about the internship program. This was a pilot that we had this year, and uh, we were super lucky to have found these six wonderful interns that were working with us. Three of them were promoting and helping us um, do a state-of-the-art for the OI Latam node. Then we had uh, tech support, which was uh, Alan from Kaplan. I'll, I should say their names. Cristel Gutierrez, Maria Angelica Martinez, and Agustina Huertas were working with us for the OI Latam node. Alan Oti was helping and supporting tech support. And then in communications and trend research, Hamis Huma and Justice Okai. Uh, and it was such a wonderful experience for us that we're looking forward to continuing the internship program next year. And uh, that's it for me now. So I'm passing along to Igor. So and I just want to highlight again that if there's anything that you want to learn more about the projects that we're working on, don't hesitate to reach out. Now you know our team, our board members, Igor and I, and we would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela. Donna, I'm going to be very brief, just one minute, and then we are done. Uh, just one thing that we would like to also highlight is the network of open orgs. Open Education Global has been coordinating the network since 2009. Uh, it was constituted or assembled uh, when the UNESCO OER recommendation was adopted. And the purpose of the network is to support the implementation of the UNESCO OER recommendation, but also to work on large scale uh, open education initiatives that really require that kind of global coordination or coordinated action and collaboration. There are numerous organizations that are part of the network. Uh, many of them are actually present here as well. ICD, Spark, Spark Europe, uh, Creative Commons, um, UNESCO as well, and many others. Um, if you want to learn more about the network and its activities, please come join us this afternoon. Um, you will see it's gonna be a session from 3.45 to 4.15. And just as a reminder that we do have a strategic plan in place, which is built around the three main pillars of knowledge exchange, field building, and value co-creation. And over the next few months, we are really looking forward to working with you as members and the community at large on its implementation. Thank you very much to all of you. Have a lovely conference. OGN is the Global OER Graduate Network and a global network of PhD candidates whose research projects focus on open education. This year, they are celebrating 10 years of helping open research. Please welcome Beck Pitt and Rob Farrow to talk about GoGN. Thank you so much, and it's wonderful uh, to be here um, today. Um, my name is Beck Pitt, and I'm with my colleague Rob Farrow, and we're from the Global OER Graduate Network, or GOGN, and we're thrilled to be a partner for this year's OE Global Conference. It's absolutely fantastic and a real honor for us um, to be here, and we're very grateful for the support of OE Global, Norquest, and the Hewlett Foundation to enable us to participate and be here today with more than 30 of our GoGM members uh, and alumni. So GoGN, um, we support 
researchers working in um, open education and connect researchers around the world, sometimes working or being the only person in their institution researching around open education. Um, we're also very much focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and also on, on modeling and supporting open research practices. Wonderful. So as was mentioned, we've been celebrating 10 years of um, GoGN um, uh, this year. And we've been having holding a two-day workshop prior to uh, the OE Global Conference, which has been really fantastic. We've brought together 30 um, of our members, as I mentioned, um, to, uh, to connect and to talk about their research and also to kind of um, work together to co-create, and we'll be sharing some more about what we've been doing shortly. So I'm going to hand over to Rob now to tell you a bit more. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Beck. Hi, everyone. Uh, what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be here with you and to see so many old friends and um, uh, have those connections again, catch up with people and think about the future. That's a big part of what we've, we've been doing uh, while we've been here in Canada. Um, we're hoping to have something out of this workshop that will give us a sense of strategic direction for not just GoGN, but for open education research going forward. So it's really great to uh, have involvement from our members, but we'd also be interested from hearing from the wider community about what you'd like to see from the network. Um, one of the things we've been doing um, over the last few years is um, focusing on trying to leverage the network and build on our collective intelligence around open education research. We've published a number of openly licensed uh, guides in the last few years, including uh, a guide to research methods, a guide to conceptual frameworks, uh, collections of research reviews, and bundled it up with a whole load of openly licensed materials relevant to researchers. You can find that all in the Open Research Handbook on the website. Um, you're free to remix this, remix this, do what you like with it. We um, intend to add to it on a modular basis going forward, so this will be a living document. Um, that it's not just useful for open education research, hopefully, but all researchers. So go and check it out if you have the inclination. Um, you may be thinking, why, why do I keep seeing these penguins? What's it all about? <laughs> and if I told you, then, you know, that would spoil the mystery. But it also take too long. We'd be eating into Cable's time, I think. Um, but the penguin artwork is done by Brian Mathers, uh, who's our, our visual artist. And he set up a way for you to contact us by sending us a virtual postcard. All of our art, art assets are openly licensed for people to use as well. Check this out. <laughs> We're also PowerPoint experts as well. <laughs> so um, you may be thinking, well, research is not for me, maybe. Um, you could be right, I don't know. But GoGN is for everybody, right? GoGN is for all members. Um, and you're free to join. We're focused on doctoral research, but we have a much wider network of experts and friends. You're all welcome to join. Um, so come to the website, use the QR code, and just check it out. Um, you can join the conversation around GoGN's 10th anniversary on the GoGN10 hashtag. You can also just interact with the network using the GoGN hashtag as well. So thanks so much for your attention, and have a great conference. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Robert Lawson. I'm an instructional designer with curriculum development at Northwest College. And I'm also one of the program co-chairs um, who helped to put together the program for this year's conference. And um, I'm very excited right now to introduce our um, next keynote speaker. This is someone I encountered for the first time uh, at the University of Alberta during Open Education Week. Uh, it was a webinar and kind of an introduction to open education resources. And I really had no kind of background in open education at that time. I probably couldn't even have told you what an OER is. Um, so uh, listening to him speak really helped me to understand the open education landscape. It helped me to understand what the Creative Commons licenses were. and. Um, he also introduced some very compelling uh, introductory research on how open educational resources are equal to, or in some cases better,
than traditional publisher resources. So it was a wonderful moment, and um, it really inspired me to, uh, in part, get into open education. And um, so therefore, I'm very excited that we are going to welcome Dr. T Cable Green to speak to us today. And um, he's been a very prominent figure in the open education landscape for a number of years. Um, he's done some very exciting work in looking at how open licensing, open education can help to resolve complex problems, can help to uh, help us to reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, I think this is just fantastic. It really illustrates the power of open education to, to help us with these, uh, with these very complex issues. So um, I think uh, he's a wonderful choice to really speak to our conference theme, uh, Building a Sustainable World Through Open Education. And uh, I just want to mention that he's done so much work in open education, um, been involved in so many different projects. Uh, there, there are just too many to name, but um, you know, there's the Open Course Library, uh, Open Up Resources, Digital Public Goods Standard, UNESCO recommendations on OER, uh, Open Science, Open Climate Campaign, and he's also been involved in the Open Climate Data Project, among many others. So um, uh, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Cable Green, the Director of Open Knowledge for Creative Commons, and uh, a real trailblazer in the field of open education. Hi, everybody. Uh, first, uh, a big thank you for the, uh, for the invitation to come speak. It's always an honor to, uh, to come to this conference at all and to be asked to be one of the keynotes is a great honor. So thank you for that and thank you to the program committee and, uh, and uh, the folks at OE Global for the kind invitation. Uh, as I was sitting there listening to people talk about sustainability, uh, I realized there are several people in the audience that have sustained me. So uh, Kathy Casserly, if you didn't know, actually hired me uh, 12 years ago at Creative Commons. I wouldn't even be in this business if it wasn't for Kathy. And so, Kathy, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, there are several people here that uh, you may know. I, uh, I almost uh, died a few years ago. I uh, had a liver transplant. And there are people here in the audience that actually uh, came to the hospital and took care of me uh, when I was there. Um, and uh, one of our friends, uh, David Wiley, who actually gave me part of his liver, which was an important part of my sustainability. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know the story, he actually asked his surgeon to put a Creative Commons license on the piece of liver <laughs> that was coming from him to me and because he wanted attribution <laughs> forever. And uh, the surgeons did not think that was funny. And <laughs> And they told him to stop talking about that. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, wanted to lighten the mood a bit, because we'll talk about some serious topics. So today, what I, I want to talk about um, in terms of sustainability is I think uh, that several sectors of open uh, uh, that I'll talk about today have hit a bit of a moment uh, where it seems like uh, we may have hit some existential threats. Uh, existential threats uh, and a bit of a crisis moment, uh, but also I think there's tremendous opportunity. And so I want to talk about, talk through what I think uh, over the last 20 years collectively uh, we've agreed upon in terms of some foundational principles and how we might use those to go forward. So uh, this is a brand new keynote. I've titled it uh, Diamond Open Knowledge. It'll make more sense uh, in a moment. Uh, so, of course, all these slides, unless otherwise noted, are CC BY. Um, I have reached out to several colleagues. You'll see them credited at the bottom of the slides. Um, I actually uh, don't know if their, their works are CC BY, so please just use uh, mine if you want to reuse uh, or reach out to those other folks. Uh, I am with Creative Commons. I'm the director of open knowledge at CC. Um, as I said, I'm going on 13 years. I was uh, director of open ed for a long time, uh, was CEO for a while. 
uh, and now have a broader portfolio of open knowledge, which, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, CC, if you're not familiar with us, we are a, a global nonprofit organization. Uh, we are uh, kind of the de facto open licenses steward for open copyright licenses that the world uses. We're 20 years old, 20, more than that, 22 years old now. Um, the licenses work everywhere, uh, and uh, like OE Global, we have uh, teams around the world. Uh, we call them CC Country Chapters, uh, and, uh, and they help uh, countries and, and other communities locally. Um, just a few facts about uh, the licenses, which sometimes people don't know. Um, licenses are free, they've always been free, they always will be free, and to ensure that we've dedicated them, all of our legal tools, uh, to the public domain, so they're there forever. Uh, we are 20 years old, this will be important in just a moment, um, and, uh, and some other facts here. Uh, of course, uh, the CC licenses are legal tools, they're backed by the full force of copyright, they've never lost in court, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's all fine, and that's an important part of what we do, is the steward of the licenses, uh, but that's not the most important thing that we do. So our vision at Creative Commons is to, uh, to work on, create, improve a world where knowledge and culture are equitably shared in ways that serve the public interest. So you see that we're already very well aligned with the strategic plan at OE Global that was just put up. We're talking about public interest, public good. That'll be the main theme of today's chat. Uh, so I mentioned the licenses. I, of course, won't go through these today, but we have this whole suite of licenses so that people can have the tools that they want and, uh, and uh, public domain tools uh, as well. Uh, we proudly uh, put the, we say we put the open in, open access research and open educational resources, open data, and other sectors of open. I'm mostly gonna talk about today, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about open culture as much. That's another program area at CC. I'm gonna focus on open knowledge, and when I say open knowledge, this is what I mean. Uh, I mean open education and all the components of that. Uh, we mean open access research, open data, uh, the broader establishment of open science, which is kind of parcel and part, or open access research is part of that, but open science is broader. Uh, the open communities in these spaces, and then the open policies that exist, usually at funders to support all of these various areas. So I'm gonna take a, a moment to go through uh, what some of our key principles are at Creative Commons when we are deciding whether or not uh, we want to work on an open knowledge project. So bear with me, these uh, principles will become a, imp more important as we go through this. Uh, so first, uh, that, and you've heard me say this for years, publicly funded knowledge should be open by default. Uh, and uh, by that we mean all of this stuff, research, educational resources, et cetera. Uh, should be open by default, should be openly licensed. The data, where possible, should be in the public domain, and there should be a zero embargo period. We shouldn't have to wait to get access to open access research, to open educational resources, et cetera. That's point one. Second, public funds allocated to produce this open knowledge should be spent as efficiently and effectively as we possibly can. Open tends to be more efficient, almost always, than closed. Why, why do we put this point in? because we never have unlimited funds. We need, to be, uh, we need to be effective and efficient with the funds that we have. Uh, and I, I am a firm believer that that's part of our, our responsibility as stewards of public funds, that we, uh, we owe it to the taxpayers that paid these to be effective and efficient with them. Third, this publicly funded knowledge should be stewarded, hosted, served up, uh, analyzed by public institutions, the academy, and or trusted nonprofits. Okay, this, is, this will be kind of a key theme throughout this talk here. Um, as we're designing these systems, we should uh, design from the core out to ensure that they are socially just, that they are equitable, so that these public goods can be accessed, shared, contributed to, revised by everyone in the public. Next, commercial organizations, where we need them, should be treated as work for hire. We should hire them when we need them, uh, if we sign contracts with them, uh, we should ensure that copyright stays with us, the public, or the public institutions, or the individual authors who are writing it, uh, and, and not go to the commercial entities, which is this uh, last point, that the copyright or other intellectual property rights of publicly funded knowledge should be held by us and not by commercial entities. And nor should we transfer the ownership of publicly funded knowledge to commercial entities. 
You may say, well, obviously not, but in fact, we do this all the time, especially in the area of research and data. So I've broken the talk up into uh, four areas. I'm gonna talk about the opportunities we have in front of us, uh, some of the challenges or headwinds that we're facing at the moment, uh, the changing landscape, there's some interesting new things uh, happening, uh, and then uh, a bit of call to action of what we can do next. So what's happened in the last 20 years? Well, a, a lot, as you've seen from, <laughs> uh, from GOGN and, and uh, OE Global and Creative Commons. There are a lot of organizations which are hitting their 20th anniversary. ISKME is another one with OER Commons. There are several examples uh, where folks are hitting 10 and 20 years. So over the past 20 years, we've had this suite of tools that we've all leveraged and we've taught other people how to use. Things went digital. We can make perfect digital copies. We've had the internet for quite a while where we can share this digital stuff. We've been able to openly license it so we can legally share it and make changes to it as we see fit. And then the costs around these spaces, the cost of computing, the cost of cloud computing, the cost of network, the cost of devices has fallen. We still have digital divide issues, uh, but those costs continue to come down. And so what all this netted us was a set of a tool bag where we could legally share digital knowledge at the marginal cost of zero. This is incredibly uh, important in terms of access uh, for more people. It was important in terms of efficiency of the expenditure of public funds. Uh, there was uh, good arguments and continue to be good arguments to be made around return on investment for the investment in open things with public monies. Uh, and we reduced friction. It's much easier to share things that are digital and that are open. And so uh, if you look at the literature, you'll find uh, across all of these various categories um, of open knowledge um, that uh, it, pick your variable. Uh, open is oftentimes a better and a more effective way to do education, research, data, et cetera. Okay, so we've had those tool sets. This is nothing new. We know all this. Um, we seem to have lost our way when it comes to what we commonly refer to as, as uh, digital public goods. And so the key phrase here, or the key part of that is public goods. So I oftentimes am sitting down with, uh, with foundations or with national governments or provincial governments, and we get, they get caught up in, oh, why should that be open? Is that a threat to the business community? And I say, stop, wait a moment. <laughs> why is it that your government is interested in science? Why do you fund science in Brazil? And they'll say, well, funding science is important. We need to understand the universe. We have to understand our country. We have to understand people. We have to understand problems and how to solve diseases. And I say, okay, uh, why do you fund research? What, why do you fund education in your country? Well, you know, there's all these really good reasons. And very quickly, uh, we get to a conversation where we say, yes, knowledge is a public good. And public goods should be funded with public funds, and yet, we continuously allow uh, publicly funded knowledge to be extracted, to be commercialized. I was actually warned about being in Edmonton and using the word extracted in my talk, so I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, but we continue to allow knowledge to be extracted and commercialized by uh, commercial entities and, and have, have the knowledge extracted, commodified, and then sold back to us, right? Uh, and so this is something that we've uh, allowed. Uh, quick, quick, quick side note, um, I'm not up here to bash commercial entities, not at all. They just have a different set of incentives than we do, right? They are not in the, th their mission statement is not produce as many public goods as possible at the highest quality level and make those freely available to as many people as possible. That's not their job. Their job is to build shareholder value and to raise their stock prices and to to generate revenue, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different set of priorities than often what we're talking about, right? Our foundation principles are things like this. Uh, open sharing uh, advances univer universal access to these various areas of knowledge uh, and culture. This is about human rights. If you go and you look at the United Nations foundational documents, you will see things like education is a human right, and they talk about the importance of science for the betterment of humanity. These are not things that ought be commercialized and put behind paywalls. These are things that we all should have access to. I told you I worked at Creative Commons. Creative Commons just had its 20th birthday. That was a lot of fun. We waved the flag, but we were mostly interested in what do we do in the next 20 years. So we started asking questions. And one of the answers that we came up with is we really want to work on the biggest challenges in the world today. 
And so what are those biggest challenges? Well, we all talk about these. Uh, we looked toward the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we started off by saying, well, which of these? They're, these are all important. These are all uh, unanimously supported by, uh, by nations around the world through the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, they all need work, but what's most pressing? Uh, we've decided to focus on uh, 13, 14, and 15 to start. Climate change, if you haven't heard, is a bit of a problem. And so uh, we decided to start there. Our kind of key idea is that, so, so why Creative Commons? Why should, why should CC of all these various organizations work on the SDGs? And our kind of core argument is that if you want to solve any of these problems, doesn't matter which one you pick, if the knowledge and the culture about these problems is closed and locked up behind a paywall, you don't get to solve the problems. Imagine trying to solve I don't know, uh, let's pick one. Uh, imagine trying to solve affordable and clean energy, number seven. But all the research about affordable and clean energy is locked up, and unless you're rich, you don't get to read the research. What if all the educational resources about affordable and clean energy are also locked up? Now learners don't get to read it. UNESCO just ran a study uh, six, eight months ago that asked the question, uh, of the schools, primary and secondary, or in the United States, we call them K-12 schools, of all the schools in the world, how many of them have curriculum on climate education? The answer, did anybody see this study? No, it wasn't zero, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was 48, 49%, which on the one hand says, sounds pretty good, like there's a lot of schools that have it. On the other hand, it's over half of the schools in the world have nothing about climate curriculum. And one of the reasons for that was they can't afford it. Right? They can't, it's, it's out of their budget, they can't go buy the curriculum. So, you know, why do we not have OER on all of the SDGs made freely available for, for all schools around the world? And so this is our argument at Creative Commons. If you want to solve the world's biggest problems, the knowledge and the culture must be open. Knowledge, I think we kind of get in this room. We need the education open, educational resources, we need the research, we need the data. That, that makes sense to us. What about culture? So my, my colleague Brigitte at Creative Commons leads our open culture program. The idea there is several fold, but the core idea is that if you look at the SDGs, these are all human caused problems for the most part. And if you don't understand the culture of the humans that cause these problems, you don't understand the culture of the humans that are gonna need to solve these problems today, the knowledge isn't enough, right? Okay, moving on. So I, I said we decided to tackle climate and biodiversity first. We took a good hard look at this, and uh, what if you look over on the right side of the screen, this is the punchline. Uh, how many? How much of the climate research is open? The time scale here was 1980 to 2020. Um, we've got a live dashboard of this. It's constantly updating, and the good news is it's getting more open. But it's still about half of all of the climate research in the world is locked up behind paywalls. This also happens to be climate research, which was funded by public governments around the world, right? So we've given our knowledge over, it's now locked up. Our climate researchers can't get access to it. And so it's like this, right? We've tied one arm behind our backs trying to work on climate change, and half of the climate research and the data that we've paid for as a public, we can't get access to unless you're a rich institution somewhere that can afford the exorbitant uh, uh, access fees. That's a problem. And so it looks something like this. If you can imagine, these are a bunch of climate researchers uh, around the world. We've got this paywall, which is stopping knowledge from, from moving forward. Uh, we decided to do something about that. Uh, we put together a coalition uh, called the Open Climate Campaign. You'll find this at openclimatecampaign.org if you want to see more information. And the core idea of the campaign, this is a four-year uh, campaign to promote open access to research to accelerate progress towards solving the climate crisis. We know that opening up the research and the research data is not the whole solution. Our argument is if you want to solve climate change, you had better have access to all the research and all the data, or it's simply a non-starter. 
If you're interested in the campaign, you can sign up. One of the things, while, we're, we, while we are focused on research and research data for the Open Climate Campaign, we are also, uh, I know there are several people in the room we've talked to about this, uh, we're also very interested in the open educational resources about climate. So if you have OER about climate at your institution, or you've got climate researchers who, or professors who you think might want to open up their educational resources, please let us know. We're eager to make that part of the campaign as well. Second project that we launched is called our Open Climate Data Project. Um, this is not research data. This is the largest climate data sets in the world. So this is like uh, Copernicus in Europe and the European Space Agency. This is NASA's data in the United States, NOAA's data, all the weather data and the sea level rise data and temperature data. So these are big petabytes, terabyte uh, size data sets uh, all around the planet, and we brought those folks together and asked the question, how can we share, how can you share your data better than you're sharing it today across a whole host of variables? Legal was certainly one of them. Uh, many of them were not openly licensed or dedicated to the public domain, but a lot of it was about technical interoperability and ease of getting access to an account and getting access to APIs, et cetera. And so we're working with them to make that data more shareable. Same argument. You don't get to solve climate change if the data about climate change is not open and easy to get to. Okay, next, challenges. Um, everything I'm talking about, about how we, can, we uh, wanna keep commercial interests uh, as work for hire, commercial interests don't like this. Apologies to any commercial interests that may be in the room. Um, here, uh, there, <laughs> there are several things that uh, commercial entities in various sectors of open are doing to push back on our collective efforts. Here, I just wanna highlight two very quickly. Uh, the first one in the area of, of research. For open access research, we started off 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, worried about large uh, subscription rates to journals. So journals were very expensive to subscribe to, and basically you had to be rich if you wanted to read. And then over 20 years, we flipped that, and now you have to be rich if you wanna write. And so we have this thing called article processing charges where the journal said, fine, you want everybody to read for free? You're gonna pay on the front end instead of paying on the back end and we'll make the same amount of money. And so they have these things called article processing charges where after your article's been peer reviewed and accepted, you have to pay a fee to the journal. So let me back up a step. Your research was funded with public money from probably your national government. You got the grant, you did the research, you, your team worked it, you produced multiple articles, now you wanna publish, and what do they ask you for? What do you have to turn over to them? Somebody shout it out. Money and your copyright, right. They want your copyright, so now you own nothing, your national government owns nothing, your educational institution owns nothing, and now you've turned over the rights and then they sell it back to you again. Right, Rajiv, you have a term for this. What do you call it with your fire extinguisher? What's the phrase? It'll come to him. <laughs> right, so this is a real problem. And uh, we'll talk about this more in just a minute. The second one in education, uh, and I was just talking with some uh, Canadians here today. This is a big problem in the United States. Apparently this is also hitting uh, all of you in Canada and I think some parts of Europe as well. Our publishers are saying, okay, We've listened to the OER arguments, day one access, reduced costs, uh, making sure everybody, all students have access to it throughout the, the year. We can play that game as well. We're gonna call it inclusive uh, or equitable access. So I want you to look at the terms. They've taken our terms, kind of like uh, uh, you know, greenwashing, if you will, sometimes happens. This is like open washing. Uh, coined by, uh, by our colleague. You can actually go to openwashing.org and see a, a good definition. Uh, and so inclusive access, the idea is that rather than students paying for curricular costs or textbook costs, all that gets wrapped into and hidden, I would argue, in the cost of tuition. And so then the students simply pay higher tuition uh, and good news, uh, your textbooks and other materials are free. Well, they're not free. Uh, they've been hidden, you're paying for them in your tuition. The problem with these programs are the challenges for all of you who are working uh, to promote the use and, and production of open educational resources is now the faculty at these institutions. And by the way, these tend to be three-year contracts that universities and colleges are getting locked into. Uh, the message to the faculty is you've got unlimited access to all of these catalog of commercial materials, 
uh, and you can use them and your students have already paid for them. And so the incentive to use OER because of cost or some of the argue, other arguments may go down. A lot of faculty are still hanging on to OER because they like the open license part of it. They want to be able to modify it, translate it, uh, use it in the class the way that they want to. But nevertheless, this is a headwind. Uh, if you haven't seen inclusive access, it, it looks like this. Uh, the costs are hidden in tuition. Um, there are additional costs for, uh, for print. Uh, there are uh, access typically expires either at the end of the course or when the student matriculates from the institution. Uh, and these are all rights reserved copyrighted materials. So there's no uh, legal rights to, to revise or remix. OER, you know the story there. Uh, if you want more on this, uh, our colleague Nicole Allen at Spark runs uh, a great website called inclusiveaccess.org uh, that talks about some of the facts of, of how this is happening. Um, I'll give you an example uh, that we just faced uh, in the United States. Uh, the White House, uh, under the current administration, uh, did a good job and said, hey, all of the research that we fund with public funds in the United States, uh, we're going to make it more open and accessible than it was before. So new data sharing standards, uh, we're going to take it from a 12-month embargo to zero embargo so that the public gets access immediately. There were a bunch of goodies in it. They talked about open licensing for the first time and the importance of text and data mining. Uh, so this was a big win. Uh, just a few months later, the American Association of Publishers uh, went to the U.S. Congress uh, with uh, campaign contributions and other incentives and actually put this language into the appropriations bill, uh, which is how we fund operations in the U.S. government. Uh, and I quote, none of the funds made available in this appropriations bill may be used to implement, administer, apply, enforce, or carry out the new memo from the White House to ensure free, immediate, or equitable access to federally funded research. So you can have your nice little policy that says we're gonna share public knowledge, but you can't use any federal money to implement it, okay? This is the kind of fight that they bring at the highest levels of government. They do not want publicly funded knowledge to be open. It is not in their interests, and they will do everything they can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay, changing landscape. I believe there are some new opportunities in front of us. Uh, CC, OE Global, many organizations worked with UNESCO to help write uh, two really important recommendations uh, that recently uh, came out. Uh, the first one was the UNESCO Rec on OER. This was back in 2019, a few years ago, unanimously adopted by UNESCO member states. Next up was the recommendation on open science, also unanimously adopted in 2021 by all UNESCO member states. So this is good. Both of these documents say publicly funded knowledge should be open by default. They go further and they talk about the importance of open licensing policies and open procurement. They talk about the values of public knowledge. So we've got these international frameworks that we can lean on, that we can use. Igor talked about the network of open orgs. This is a group of us that convene and we're trying to figure out how can we support national governments around the world to implement the recommendation on OER. There's similar conversations happening around the, the rec on open science. When we work with national governments, we have scaled impact, right? So this is also something we're doing with the open climate campaign. We're going right to national governments and we're saying to their ministers of science, will you please require that all future, as of this date going forward, all climate research and data is open? And now that we have your attention, will you just do that for all publicly funded research? So it seems to me that we're at this point uh, in the conversation where we should be asking, how do we share knowledge, publicly funded knowledge, in the most effective, efficient, equitable, and socially just, just way. Well, many organizations have an opinion about this. The European University Association came out and said, a just scholarly publishing ecosystem needs to be steered by the research community and its institutions through coordinated policies. Uh, next week is International Open Access Week. Their theme, community over commercialization. Right? There is, how many people have heard of Diamond Open Access? Okay, a few of us. I've been watching this, this is kind of why I built this keynote in the first place. Um, I've been watching this 
emerge in the open access space for the last couple of years. Um, open access, as I mentioned, has watched the space go from really high uh, subscription rates, where you had to be rich to read, to really high article processing charges, where now you have to be rich to write. There are parts of the world that don't have the kind of money which is necessary to pay these high article processing charges. And so they started asking the question, this is mostly in Latin America, they're the real leaders in this space. They started asking the question, what could it look like if you didn't have to be rich to read and you didn't have to be rich to write? What if both ends of that spectrum were available at no cost? How much money would it take to run journals, to run the peer review process, to do all the things that we need to do to have quality uh, publish research publishing processes with all the services therein? Could we do that? And could we do that as a public good, as public infrastructure to support public research knowledge? And their answer was, yes, let's go build it. And so the idea of diamond OA, um, and I should, quick caveat here, the word diamond, um, I'm not sure that's gonna stick around. Diamond, of course, are related to blood diamonds. D diamonds are uh, related to colonialism and extraction from many countries, and so it's not a friendly word in that sense. So a lot of people are starting to uh, move away from talking about diamond and talking instead about community owned and operated. It's a bit longer, I, we'll see how the phrasing comes out, but I just wanted to say this is something that's under discussion. Um, but for right now, I'm using the word diamond because next week there's the Diamond Open Access Conference in Mexico, <laughs> and so um, there's, there's still some name recognition around it. Uh, but this is a, uh, a work in progress. Um, and so it's, Diamond is trying to move toward this idea of, of community over commercialization. How can we, the nonprofit, the academic community, actually take back this space? So they're doing it in several ways. Let me bring these up here. Uh, so first, uh, Diamond Open Access doesn't charge uh, subscription fees, doesn't charge article processing charges. Um, in 2021, there was a big study done just asking the question, is anybody doing this? And the answer was, yeah, a lot of people are doing it. There are over 29,000 journals in 2021. There's even more today that are operating on this diamond uh, model. Uh, something like two thirds of them are in Latin America. Why are they in Latin America? Because they didn't, in many cases, the universities and the researchers didn't have the funds to play in the existing commercial models. And so they just built something new. It was very innovative. Uh, these tend to be relatively small, they're multilingual, they're across all sectors of what we teach in universities, all different disciplines. Uh, but Diamond OA is more than just about cost, it's also about governance. And so the idea is that uh, instead of turning over ownership, instead of turning over the responsibility of services, of hosting, of data analytics, of all these things that research needs and does, we, the community, are gonna build those things. We're gonna build the public infrastructure. We will own it. University presses will operate those things and other nonprofit entities. Uh, both in terms of the content related elements but also many of the services that are provided. So why do we need to do this? Well, because over 25 years, commercial publishers have created oligopolies where they have controlled the space. Anybody heard about the company Elsevier? Right? There's been a lot of consolidation of the space where Elsevier and other companies like them have bought up journals, and when you get oligopolies or monopolies, uh, they control the market and they can raise prices, and there's not a lot that we can do about it, except that there is, we control everything. So I'm always careful not to blame Elsevier or Pearson or any of these other companies. None of this is their fault. They are acting as they act as commercial entities. This is our fault. It's our fault when we sign over our copyright. That's our choice. It's our fault when we let our public funds be extracted and go somewhere else. That's something that we have the power to stop. And so a lot of what they're talking about in the diamond open access space is this idea that we need to take back control. Researchers need to stop turning over their copyright. They need to retain their rights and not turn those rights over. We need to retain control of the various content and service related elements. There is, as you might expect, a plan for how are we gonna do all this stuff. It's called the Diamond Action Plan. Um, this is led kind of, it's co-created by Science Europe, uh, Coalition S, 
uh, big players like Redelic in Latin America and others, and they've come together uh, and said, let's work on this globally. Let's not work separately and recreate the wheel. We all have the same problem. We all can get together and talk about a common solution, and we need to be coordinated in our efforts because we're simply outgunned when it comes to lobbyists and money uh, and, and resources, and so we must work together. And if we stand in solidarity, sorry, there's a lot of union action happening in the United States. I'm a bit of a solidarity person right now. Um, <laughs> yay to the unions. We need more union activity. Um, uh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Now I'm thinking about union negotiations. Um, so next week, actually, in Toluca, Mexico, um, uh, many of us will be back on the plane to go back there. There's uh, the second Diamond Open Access Conference. So the point I want to make here, and I'm, you can probably see this coming, um, there is an opportunity to work collectively globally if we truly want to take back publicly funded knowledge. And they're showing us how to do it. They've got a roadmap for how they're going to actually pull this off. They are acting globally. They're not acting regionally. They're not acting as individual institutions. They're acting globally, and they're taking the time to do it. There are uh, supportive recommendations, not just from the UNESCO recommendation on open science, uh, but also from the European Council itself. Um, just a couple highlights here. They want zero embargo period as well, immediate OA. Authors shouldn't have to pay APCs. Uh, nonprofit, scholarship, nonprofit scholarly publishing models need to be supported. And it's not just Diamond OA. There's other interesting models out there like Subscribe to Open and others. Uh, rights need to be reserved. Pricing needs to be transparent. All things that we oftentimes don't have when our knowledge is extracted into commercial spaces. There are, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say the letters AI while I was standing on stage. I know we're all thinking about it. We're, we're wondering. Uh, what's next? I think this is an interesting opportunity for the open education space as well. Uh, we in, in the OER space, uh, a lot of our work has been in the fat part of the tail where we have the uh, highest enrolled courses. And when you get to the long part of the tail where there's you know, fewer students, we oftentimes don't build OER there because the return on investment just isn't as high. We don't serve as many students, there aren't as many cost savings, et cetera. We don't have as many people to work on sustaining that content over time. Um, I, I've seen some interesting experiments where, you know, we can take, uh, we can ask certain AI uh, devices to help us create OER. It's still in its infancy, but I think it's something we should keep uh, an eye on. Uh, there's some interesting work happening uh, at the Khan Academy and other places about this idea of personal AI tutors. It is fraught with controversy, I realize. I'm very interested in that. Uh, I saw some, uh, we had Anna, Anya Kamenetz uh, keynote the CC Summit last week in Mexico, and she showed some research that these tutors are actually just distracting right now in the classroom and aren't very helpful yet. But again, uh, interesting, uh, interesting idea, something for us to keep an eye on in education. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I mentioned I was at the Mayo Clinic getting a liver transplant. I just read a Mayo paper the other day about how they were, uh, they had rubrics that they used to use that were human created and that helped them make medical decisions uh, about people that had the diseases that I had. And now they're uh, using AI to analyze those. And instead of running a few scenarios, they're having the AI run millions of different scenarios. And they actually improved the rubric and got better outcomes as a result. Uh, just using chat GPT-4 to run some analyses. Um, we've got universal translation, climate solution options, interesting things. Um, I think those are something for us to keep the eye on. I'm particularly worried about the challenges right now. I think now is the moment where, uh, where regulation is starting to happen, discussions are happening at the highest levels, and we need to be in these conversations uh, today. Um, I think that we need to be looking at uh, public infrastructure, just like we need public infrastructure for research and for educational resources. We also need public infrastructure for AI training, data sets, for machine learning, for compute power, et cetera. Um, we need to uh, make sure that if we're going to use AI in education, that these AI things are not hallucinating and making up fake citations and like that's none of that. That's just all garbage in, garbage out. Um, how do we make sure that these training sets that the AI is training on are not biased today? They're tremendously biased, and we can't look at them 
and the algorithms are closed as well. And so the, the, our ability to critique and analyze and improve and iterate, we don't have access to that today, and we must have access to that. Um, and, then, and then this last one here, I think, goes to the heart of our movement, which is how do we ensure equitable access to AI knowledge analysis, knowledge production for everyone? If you look at the big AI players, they are moving toward paid models. And the question, just like article processing charges on research, will people be cut out because they don't have the money to pay for these services? I'm worried about that, and we need to keep an eye on it. Um, I'm not going to read through this. This is too, way too much text. I'm going to invite you to go look at it. Out of the Creative Commons Summit last week, uh, so, so I should say, our, our theme for the conference was AI and the commons. And so we talked a lot about AI. And at the end of it, we came out uh, with this. This is on the Creative Commons blog. Uh, you can find it, but it's seven principles for regulating generative AI to protect the interests of creators, people building in the commons, and society's interests in the sustainability of the commons. So that was our angle on this. And like I said, there's, there's seven here. I'm not going to read through them, but I want to highlight number seven because it pertains to this talk. We said to counterbalance the current concentration of resources in the hands of small number of companies, these measures need to be flanked by public investment, public infrastructure for computational infrastructures that serve the needs of the public interest, users of this technology on a global, global scale. In addition, there also needs to be public investment in training data sets that respect the principles outlined above. Principles like uh, making sure that people are opting in and their data is not being sucked up without their permission. So if you're interested in this space, I invite you to go take a look at this. Okay, so what do we do now? There's a lot of stuff that's going on. We've got threats, we've got opportunities. What should we do now? I think first and foremost, we need to recognize that we have tremendous power. And not just us in this room, but governments that are giving out money have tremendous power. And we can fight back without fighting anybody. We just need to change our own behavior and our own actions. And so this is an example. This was an article, uh, I believe, in The Guardian uh, that talked about 40 leading scientists leaving an Elsevier journal. The journal was called NeuroImage. This was like the top journal if you were into neuroimaging and, uh, of the brain using CT and, and MRI scans. Uh, this is where you wanted to be published. And Elsevier, this journal was incredibly expensive. Elsevier wouldn't lower the cost. The APCs were very high. And these editors, which really were the people that made the journal quality, and high impact in the eyes of promotion and tenure committees around the world, they said, no more. We are leaving. They got up and they walked. And they went and they created a brand new open access journal. And they said, we're taking our expertise and our reputation and we're going over here. And don't publish there anymore. And they put out a memo to the entire neuroscience community. And they said, this is what we did and you should think about doing the same. Right? That was within their power to do so. They didn't have to fight Elsevier. They sent Elsevier a memo that said, we're leaving, good luck. Okay, we can fight back with the policies that we put on the money. At CC, we often refer to this as shifting the money to open. So if you require that publicly funded knowledge is open by default, guess what? It's open by default. <laughs> if it's educational resources funded, you have OER, if it's research that's funded, you have open access research. If it's data, you've got open data. We have to have policies that require that things be open when they're funded with public funds. If anybody needs help doing this, give me a call. We'll get you the resources. We'll help you do it. We can also do, so that's a very top down, right? If you take our money, you're going to open up what you build because it's public funds. This is a bottom up approach. So, uh, so I'll pick on Rajiv again. Uh, uh, Rajiv is at Brock University. He's got a budget. Um, he can make decisions about how he spends his budget, including how they procure materials, resources, data, educational resources, et cetera. And so he has an opportunity at a local level, even if there isn't an open policy in his province, he can build and buy and commission what he needs done. He can ensure that he keeps the copyright uh, or, the, or Brock University keeps the copyright, or the authors that are doing the work at Brock University keep the copyright, and then they can choose, if they want to, to share and openly license. Uh, put this in shorthand, it's buy what you need, 
own what you buy and share what you own, right? We can do that locally. Um, I've talked, I just talked with our, as you can imagine, I'm all, I'm all kinds of fun at parent-teacher conferences. Um, <laughs> I always wear my CC shirt and I ask them, you know, are you using OER? And my kids are just like, oh my God, dad, <laughs> please stop. But we, I asked them this. I said, you know, how much? <laughs> so we, we live in Olympia, Washington, and they have a 500,000 USD budget every year for curriculum acquisition and procurement. Uh, we've got about 100 cells on the Excel sheet. We've got about eight subjects per grade. We've got 12 grades. That's 96 cells. Uh, with our $500,000 a year, guess how many of those cells they can update? Two a year. Right? So my kids had uh, political science textbooks in high school that uh, are copyrighted 1998. Has anything interested happened in political science since 1998? <laughs> Just a few things, right? Um, we need to build the infrastructure, the public infrastructure that we need to, uh, to make the knowledge open and to solve the world's biggest problems. Uh, this is a project that uh, Creative Commons and Open Futures and others are working with. Uh, with NORAD in Norway right now, and we're building a stack of open source software services to serve up open climate data. So I mentioned the climate data project we have at CC where we're helping the world's largest climate data sets open up and be more open. We're gonna take API feeds and we're gonna uh, jam them into this open source software stack. And just like Norway has its seed bank, this is like an open uh, climate data bank. And not only will you be able to go there, one-stop shopping for all the open climate data you might need at no cost, all open, uh, but you'll also be able to get services. So if your province or your country wants to create apps to help people have smaller carbon footprints, for example, you don't have to recreate the wheel, you don't have to build the infrastructure. Norway is gonna fund the infrastructure to make that simple and easy. Uh, we're calling this the Open Earth Platform Initiative. It's public infrastructure for public knowledge. I mentioned Redelic. This is a, an organization in Latin America that is providing infrastructure, the entire stack of infrastructure and services that are needed to support diamond open access journals. Okay, Heavily used across Latin America and increasingly used across Europe and the United States and other countries as well. So much so that they're getting into conversations about, hey, uh, Europe, you seem to be using our platform a lot. Can you kick in some funds to help sustainability? Uh, my colleague at Redelec, her name is uh, Ariana Garcia. She's amazing if you haven't seen her speak. Uh, she says the same thing that I say. This is up to us. This is our choice. We have the power. And this is one of her slides from last week. She said, look, we got two choices. Science can be a commodity that gets extracted, goes to commercial interests, gets sold back to us, and science will be embargoed. Science will be controlled by commercial companies. Science will be APC-based. You're gonna have to turn your copyright over. That's what we've been doing. Or science can be a public good, and we can have immediate open access. We can have epistemic justice. I love that phrase that she uses. We can make sure that these are equitable. Everybody in the world can, can both read and can participate in writing because science is not just for a few countries. Science is for everyone. So that's what Diamond Open Access is working on. They're building public infrastructure. What would Diamond Open Education look like or community owned and operated education? Can we do the same thing? Can we also have a global conversation and be coordinated around these ideas? Can we go to our national governments and say, hey, you signed on to the UNESCO recommendation on OER. It says publicly funded educational resources should be open by default. Can we work with them to enact those policies? And then can we also ask those governments to fund the infrastructure or support existing open infrastructure to host all of that? Um, I think we can, and I've been talking to a lot of folks that are interested in putting together such a coalition. So, you know, can we build a coalition both inside the open education community and outside? I was talking uh, last week with some folks who said, you know, we need to partner up with, uh, with labor unions. They know how to do this better than we do, and particularly uh, teacher and education 
unions because this is a, a point uh, that they care about. Um, how do we both plan for the future and figure out, like Diamond Access says, what are the what's the stack of services we need, uh, just like you saw with Redelic, but also um, how do we fight what we oftentimes refer to as a rear guard action? Because the publishers are not stopping. The commercial entities are coming to your universities all around the world, and they're trying to sign these three to five year deals where the cost of uh, educational materials gets jammed into tuition, and it makes, it makes OER or any other open activities very difficult at your institutions. We have to expose that. We have to try to stop that. We have to educate our faculty and our administrators. We need to make sure uh, that we uh, don't let that get too entrenched because as we build the plan for the future, uh, we don't want to leave behind universities that are stuck in these long-term contracts. The theme of this is sustainability. People always say, well, geez, how are we gonna pay for this? <laughs> in my opinion, the answer is very simple. Uh, we need to fund open knowledge as a public good. There's, a, there's I, I get hit every time I say this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, there's oftentimes enough money in the system, we're just really bad at how we spend it. In the United States alone, just for K-12, we spend between six and nine billion US dollars a year procuring educational resources. In higher education, it's closer to nine to 10 billion US dollars a year. How much money would we need to build open educational resources for all subjects, all grades? Is it more than $20 billion? My guess is probably not, right? But those are choices that we can make. Um, I've already said that, I'm gonna skip. So uh, final slides here. This is not easy, right? It's easy for me to stand up here and talk about it, but I realize this is really hard work. But what I put to you is that we no longer have a choice, right? The open access community got to a point where frankly they were, you know, they just said this is untenable. We have article processing charges getting entrenched systematically and we are not going to beat the commercial entities on this fight, we're simply outgunned. And so we need to take the tablecloth and pull it off the table and have a clean table and we're gonna build a different model that has different principles where we own everything, we run everything, and if we need the commercial entities, we will use them, but they will be work for hire. Um, as I said, out of the gates, we need public knowledge in order to solve the world's most pressing problems if the knowledge about climate change, if the knowledge about education, if the knowledge about gender inequality, poverty, life on land, life below water, pick your favorite SDG. If those are locked up behind paywalls, we don't get to solve the SDGs. Uh, and last, it's our job to ensure that uh, publicly funded knowledge is a public good accessible to everybody, not just the rich. I put to you, we should work together to solve big problems. There are plenty of them in the world. Uh, let's, uh, let's start working on this. Thank you very much. Can we do questions? I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, yes, please. Um, do we have a microphone? Is the microphone here? Yeah, right in the right over here. Hi. Thanks so much, Cable. I think you may have given us a theme for next year's OE Global Conference, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, I was wondering if you might uh, suggest for people who are really energized by what you're talking about here, anything that's coming up in the next few months that we might direct our attention to, how to engage in, in any particular aspects of, of uh, the work that you've laid out here? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, <laughs> if you're free next week, uh, come to the Diamond Open Access Conference in Toluca, Mexico. It's gonna be great. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's on my brain right now is, is the next week. Um, there are always opportunities to get involved with the open uh, climate campaign, of course. Uh, but, uh, but Kurt, I think the, the honest answer to your question is that we today, in the open education space, I don't think we have a good answer to that question, um, like they do in the diamond open access space. 
Um, if you ask that question in the Diamond Open OA conference, they would say, here are five ways to get involved right now. And I think that's, uh, that's a conversation that we need to have, is are we ready to act collectively uh, to actually start to, you know, starting with a plan. So they have a diamond open access plan that plots out the next 10 years and what needs to be done. Can we do the same thing in the open education space? It's not easy, uh, right? And, it, and there's gonna be a lot of disagreement and a lot of drafts that get written, um, but I think that's the direction we need to have so that when questions like that get asked, we actually have on-ramps for people. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite uh, organizations in this space is Mozilla. Uh, for projects that they run, they oftentimes put out a short pamphlet that says, if you uh, are looking for a job, here's what you can do. Uh, if you're looking to volunteer five hours a week, here's what you can do. If you only have 30 minutes a week, here's something that you can do. And they find ways, if you're a graduate student, here's how you can get involved. Uh, and so I think we need to get a bit more organized so that I can give you a better answer. That, that's actually what I think. <laughs> Hi, Cable, it's nice to see you. Uh, Cable, I have kind of a tough question. So when we talk about our community, and we have a great large community here, and we have a lot of organizations, large organizations like Creative Commons, um, they get the lion's share of the funding for open. Small organizations, small people, small nations do not. Uh, and so I'm wondering if there's a way, as a big community, we can start to solve that. Can we mentor, can we train for leadership and asking for funds? You're super good at it. If you walk to a government representative in the US, you get listened to. <laughs> For those of us who don't have that connect, it's much harder. Um, but there's so many great ideas, so many grassroots ideas. Certainly the, the, the diamond publishing, those, everybody needs to be paid for their work appropriately, right? So how can we as a community find ways to talk about how we get funding and train folks to get more funding? Great question. Um, I, I would say there's, Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I think there's two important answers to that. Uh, first is that we have to have the funders at the table as we're having these big conversations. So for example, next week in Toluca, Mexico, uh, the big open access funders are all there. The Gates Foundation will be there, Arcadia will be there, um, and many others that fund in the research space, the big scientific institutes, will be there and several governments will be there as well. Because as the plan was being written for Diamond Open Access, part of what was implied in that is we need you, the funders, to fund along this plan and not off the plan. And that's, that was also a change for the funders. The funders were used to a model where they, had, they talked with their grantees and grantees would say, hey, I've got this idea of this thing that I wanna go do and the funder would fund it, and it was a bit of a thousand flowers blooming, but not a lot of coordinated direction. And so the funders really have, in the open access space, have really adjusted their framework to, to talk about funding along that line. And so when it comes to uh, smaller organizations, individuals, uh, what I think they've done well in the open access space is, is provided a way for everyone to be involved, and because the funding is starting to align, align, align that, along that plan, there's just so much work that needs to be done in different parts of the plan. There's spaces for people to plug in, and because the funders are committed to fund the plan, it's more likely that more entities receive funding. Uh, I think that's part of the answer. Um, I think another part of the answer is uh, when you go in coalition, uh, it's easier to participate both with ideas and to receive resources and funding if you're part of the group that's acting in concert against a common plan. Uh, and I've seen some of that happen. We had several people at the CC Summit who were independent consultants who were, uh, who were attached to several of these larger projects. Uh, and that was, uh, that was how they we're getting involved because there was a, a long-term plan. I, I hope that's helpful. Great. Um, should we break? Last one. One more question. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Cable. Um, I'm just wondering. All of this um, at the macro level sounds great <laughs> because you know we're, we're we're building a system that makes the previous system obsolete. 
Um, however, if we take it down to the individual, where often those of us who are working in open education are a single person or part of maybe a two-person team on the ground, and we've got the situation where publishers are, they have their trusted relationships with individual academics, they're shortcutting a lot of the systems by um, striking deals with individual academics. They've got access uh, in that way. From, if we're looking at this as being quite overwhelming from an individual perspective, what are some of the practical things that an individual can do at their institution to start to make these changes? Good, good question, right? This comes up all the time. Um, I think there's two answers to that. The first thing is that uh, all of us collectively have a responsibility to, uh, to locate, identify, and start to solve pain points for, that make it hard for people to be open. So for example, one of the things they're talking a lot about in the Diamond Open Access space is, you know, hey, I'm a researcher, I'm just trying to get promotion and tenure so that I can become a tenured faculty member. I have to publish in six reputable journals and my promotion tenure committee defines reputable as this set of commercial journals. And I wanna publish over here in open access, but if I do, I'm worried I'm not gonna get promotion and tenure. That's a pain point, right? And part of our job is to go to those deans and those department chairs and go to those promotion and tenure committees through a variety of channels and say to them, you need to support your faculty because you know, part of it is the first half of my slides, right? Knowledge should be a public good. What you are incenting and in fact requiring of your faculty is for them to publish in closed spaces where A, they're not gonna be read as much, B, anybody who can't afford the you know, expensive subscription rates or, or maybe your faculty member can't afford the expensive APC fee to even get published in the first place. So why, you know, we have to educate them about how the existing models are harmful and why they need to change their promotion and tenure rules. So part of it is identifying pain points. Another part of it is, is, ed, is helping the individual actor, the individual faculty member, the educator, the researcher, uh, to realize there are some things that they can do on their own. So for example, with researchers, we say, stop turning your copyright over. Here's an author's addendum uh, that you can use from Authors Alliance or from Spark. There are several of them out there where you say to the publisher, yes, I will publish with you, but I will not give you my copyright. And if you have a problem with that, I'll go publish somewhere else. And more often than not, they'll take it. Uh, and then they can put it in green open access in their institutional repository and put a, an open license on it and share it. Um, we can do the same thing with our educational resources, right? As an act of self-power, we can openly license and we can share if we choose to do so. Uh, so there are things that we can do as individuals to continue to contribute to the commons and use from the commons uh, that will send signals to our colleagues. Uh, and then there are also things that we have to do at a higher level to essentially clear the pathway. Right? We need to get these barriers out of the way so that sharing is easy. For example, with the Open Climate Campaign, we're actually, we've hired OA Works to provide direct support services to researchers who want to open up their climate research and might have questions about how to do that. Like we need to clear those pathways to make sharing easy. Great. Um, Dr. Green, thank you so much for your wonderful keynote address. Thank you. Uh, it was very inspiring and um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion about this in the next couple days. And um, as a token of appreciation, um, we would like to oh. present you with this gift on behalf of Norquest Thank and you. OE Global. Thank you so much. Beautiful, thank you very much. Thank you, okay. thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, I guess it's break time. So please head out into the lobby and um, help yourself to coffee and uh, snacks. Yeah.